is anybody out there? Is this working? Um, this is Carrie Bible, tour guide at Hollywood Forever Cemetery, and this is week 16 of Tour Talk. I'm amazed I've been doing it this long, but um, I enjoy doing these and uh, people seem to enjoy watching them, so hey, why not? Um, can you guys let me know if you can see me and hear me? Because sometimes I just don't know if the stuff is working. Um, I'm actually completely live this particular week because last night I had a tour today and last night I tried to pre-record a segment and oh, hey Kathy Williams thank you um, and I had trouble with my computer freezing with the video freezing and it was getting late and I got frustrated so I thought okay I'm just gonna do this totally live tomorrow after the tour is over which is what I'm doing so First off, the update that I know you probably care about the most and why many of you might be here, and that's Close Up the Cat. Well, uh, first off, Close Up does have his own Instagram account now. So on Instagram, he's Close Up the Cemetery Cat, and I am going to post daily content about Close Up and his life at the cemetery. Um, this past week has seen the mystery of the doppelganger deepen because one of the cat caretakers told me the doppelganger was named Leela and it was a girl. Now the head cat caretaker, the one who is in charge of all the spaying and neutering, this week we were talking and she told me the doppelganger is not a girl, it's a boy, and that its name is Jet. So there seems to be some confusion about the gender and about the name, which is kind of cool because it only deepens the mystery. Um, I did stop in one day this week for a little bit uh, for a visit and I noticed the doppelganger is getting very emboldened. Um, the doppelganger used to just kind of lurk in the background making a very rare appearance. But I think now the doppelganger is kind of getting a taste for the attention and really enjoying it. So I think that is going to be a real problem for close up in the weeks ahead. And I don't know, a cat fight could be on the horizon. I hope not. but. A uh, close-up is very alpha, and I really don't think he's going to have his treats, food, attention um, compromised by the presence of another cat. So we'll see what happens. But um, I just finished a tour today, which is why I'm a little hot and sweaty. But it went really well, and close-up took much of the tour. So he comes running when I call his name. He comes over to Griffith J. Griffith now instead of Stimmel. That's where he shows up now is at Griffith. And he took a lot of the tour. He let me pet him a great deal. He let other people on the tour pet him. He was very, very much enjoying the attention today. So it was very good. So that's kind of the update on Close Up. And again, look him up on Instagram at Close Up the Cemetery Cat. Um, this week, I know there's still a lot of stars that I haven't gotten to yet. And trust me, I'm working on it and I'll, I'll get to them. I kind of feel like hopscotching around for some reason just because that's what I feel like doing. Um, this week, I thought I would talk about a cinematographer because basically when people see a movie, I think the general public, they think about the movie star or maybe the director. But the truth is there is an army of creative talent, of craftsmen, of artisans that go into making a film. And there are so many people behind the scenes that contribute because filmmaking really is a team effort. And Cinematographers, I think, really get the short drift. Uh, they really get the kind of acknowledgement that they deserve. And without those people, you don't have a movie. So I thought um, I would put a cinematographer on the video today because there's one cinematographer that I always manage to talk about on the cemetery tour most of the time, and that's Harold Rawson. And I thought we would talk about him today. Harold Rawson was born in New York City in 1895 and he entered the film business in 1915. So he was in it very, very early on. And in New York City, he was fortunate enough to really have a great training ground there. And he wound up working as a cinematographer, which basically meant he did the lighting and camera work on movies. He worked on several Gloria Swanson films in New York, including Zaza and Manhandled, both of which are now on DVD, by the way. And he worked on Joseph von Sternberg's Docks of New York, which is a stunning silent film, also available. By the way, I'll post links to all these films too if you guys want to try to track them down, order them, watch them, which I encourage. So he had, he had some great training in New York. And then he was hired by MGM in 1930. And 
You know that saying, diamonds are a girl's best friend? I agree on some levels, but I don't actually, because frankly, if you are an actress, a cinematographer is a girl's best friend. It can make the difference between you looking like a complete glamour goddess and you looking like complete and total hell. Trust me on this one. So cinematographers really have a major, major power and ability to make you look your best. And it wasn't long after landing at MGM that Rawson started working with Jean Harlow. He shot several films that she starred in, including Red Dust, Red-Headed Woman, and Bombshell. And he wound up becoming Jean Harlow's third husband. So I'll briefly talk about that, but I also just want to talk about him and his life and career as well. So what happened is um, Jean Harlow was the platinum blonde bombshell, like the reigning sex bomb in Hollywood at the time. But unfortunately, she had a life filled with tragedy and scandal, and it was really a, quite a roller coaster. Her second husband, MGM executive Paul Byrne, committed suicide like two months after they were married. And it was a tremendous scandal. It was really shocking. And the studio tried to pressure Jean Harlow into saying that he killed himself because he was impotent. She wouldn't play ball with that. She refused. And she really took the high road and never discussed him for the rest of her life, actually. But she was only 21 years old. I mean, she's so young. And she was grieving. She was hurting. It was a very difficult time for her, as I think it would be for anyone. And she began an affair with a boxer named Max Baer. And he was a very famous professional boxing champion. But the problem was he was also married. And this was an issue because his wife found out about the affair with Harlow and was threatened to divorce him and name Harlow in the divorce, which would have been catastrophic. I mean, she already survived the scandal of her husband's suicide very suddenly two months after they were married. It wasn't going to survive yet another scandal. That was not going to be able to happen. So... Basically, the studio said, you have to get married and you have to do it right away to offset this scandal and completely cut it off. And so she just walked up to Harold Rossin on the set of Bombshell and just asked him to marry her. And he's no fool. I mean, she's like the reigning sex goddess in the world at the time. Who wouldn't just go, wow, how can I say no? Of course. So they eloped to Yuma, Arizona, and they got married. And when they got back, they had a press conference. And... Jean Harlow's stepfather, Marino Bello, was a mob-connected crook, basically, kind of a gigolo-type man, and he was furious when, when um, Harold Rawson announced he and Harlow were not going to live with Jean's mother and her stepfather. They were going to live at the Chateau Marmont, and I think he kind of wanted to get Harlow away from them and get her some independence and have their life separately, and Jean's mom had a grip on her that was really profound and incredibly destructive ultimately and so they moved into the Chateau Marmont but uh, Jean Harlow was kind of trying to romanticize what was essentially an arranged marriage by the studio to offset scandal and Jean Harlow got an attack of appendicitis had to go to the hospital her mother insisted that she stay in her mother's house to recover and Harold Rawson never got her back and they got a divorce and he later on in life called Jean Harlow the daughter of greedy and voracious prison keepers. And he really wouldn't discuss her beyond that. And I believe it was like in the 60s, um, Irving Shulman wrote a damning and horrendous biography of Jean Harlow. And it was completely historically inaccurate, very poorly done, poorly researched, everything. And it made her look so profane and cheap and vulgar and, and all these things that she really wasn't for anyone who knew her. And Harold Rawson was one of the many people that was very hurt by this book because they saw it as such an insult to her memory and so horrible that I've been told by some other historians that after that book came out, Harold Rawson didn't want to talk to anybody. Like he wouldn't talk to historians who wanted to interview him. I've heard stories that he just like wouldn't talk to people after that book about his life, his career, which is really sad because he had a fascinating life and career. And it really, it's a shame that he felt like he couldn't, you know, do an interview or anything like that. In any case, um, they wound up getting a divorce. And shortly after he and Harlow got a divorce, they were only married like six months or something like that, technically. But after they got the divorce, Harold Rawson got polio. 
and then he had to be put in quarantine. So it's kind of one one really bad situation after another. And then he asked MGM for a transfer. So he went to England for a while and shot some films over in England. And then he came back to Hollywood and he had a remarkable career. He shot The Wizard of Oz, Singing in the Rain, The Asphalt Jungle. He shot a ton of MGM films for Lana Turner. And clearly he was great at making these actresses look their best. I mean, again, Harlow, Lana Turner, Marilyn Monroe, there's so many MGM films that Harold Rawson shot. He also got a special Academy Award in 1936 for his work on the Garden of Allah film that starred Marlena Dietrich. And it was a very early like Technicolor film in the 30s. And he was he got a special Oscar for the cinematography on that. And he was an expert. And he had a very long career, and his family was also in the industry. He had two brothers, Richard Rawson and Arthur Rawson, who were also who worked as directors and behind the scenes. And his sister Helene Rawson also worked as an actress. And um, Harold retired in the late 1960s, so his career spanned from 1915 all the way to about, I think his last one was El Dorado in 1967 or thereabouts. So he had a very, very long career and he saw so many chapters of Hollywood history playing out in terms of the early silence, how silence evolved throughout the 1920s, the coming of sound, the coming of color, of widescreen. I mean, he, his career really spanned an incredible range of transitions in the film industry. He finally retired in 1967 and he died of a massive heart attack in 1988. He was 93 years old, so he lived a very long life. And there are, I've not been able to find any books just about Harold Rawson, but I did want to kind of mention that there have been documentaries and books about cinematography, and I recommend those because, again, those people were such, all of these cinematographers were incredible pioneers. They were artists. They were painters with light, as the saying goes. And they really had a tremendous amount of influence on the look and style of these films. And as for the Harlow connections, and by the way, there's a ton of people connected with Jean Harlow at Hollywood Forever, even though she herself is at Forest Lawn Glendale. So here's some recommendations I wanted to make. Obviously, the movie C shots. I mean, he, again, I'll, I'll post some links, but he shot a ton of great ones. Of course, Wizard of Oz, Garden of Allah, Asphalt Jungle, um, many, many classic films. And here are the books about Jean Harlow I wanted to also show you. Um, this one is called Bombshell, The Life and Death of Jean Harlow by David Sten. David Sten is a brilliant historian and biographer and preservationist, and he's one of the people that I consider like the gold standard. So whenever he does a project, it is absolutely worth watching or reading because he's really terrific. And this book really sets the record straight on so many controversies surrounding Jean Harlow and her life and talks about the marriage with Rawson. And at the end, it talks about how Rawson's extraordinary career continued. And this is such a compelling book. I read the entire thing in like one sitting, and I think you will too. So if you want a super great, compelling read for this quarantine time, I highly, highly recommend this book. And also Running Wild by David Stone about Clara Bow. That's excellent, too. And there's also another book that was written by two friends of mine that I think is also quite excellent about Jean. It's a very different perspective, though. It's called Harlow in Hollywood, The Bombshell in the Glamour Capital. And it's by Daryl Rooney and Mark Aviera, both of which are supreme experts in the field. And this one breaks down Jean Harlow's career, but also talks about the various locations that she was in around Hollywood. And... It, here's a great photo in here of Harold Rawson shooting Harlow on the set of Bombshell, directed by Victor Fleming. And by the way, I should mention, there's so many um, kind of six degrees of separation from the, the people at Hollywood Forever because so many of them made films together, worked together, knew each other, had friendships, relationships, whatever. Well, Harold Rawson worked with Victor Fleming, who's at the cemetery, with John Huston with Cecil B. DeMille, with William DeMille. So there's a lot of people at the cemetery that Harold Rawson worked with and collaborated with. Well, this is a great photo in this book of the set of Bombshell. 
Here's Harold Rawson behind the camera, can you see? And then Victor Fleming sitting there in the director's chair, and then Harlow and I believe Lee Tracy in the photo here. And also it talks about Jean Harlow and Harold Rawson's time at the Chateau Marmont, which I'm sad to say is actually turning into a private club apparently and will no longer be open to the public and or presumably working class people such as myself. But um, I'm still glad that it'll be saved in any case. I guess this is kind of a world where we have to take what we can get. And the Chateau Marmont is where she lived during her brief marriage to Harold Rawson. And he, again, he wanted to kind of take her away from her mom, which unfortunately he did not win that battle. But um, there's pictures of them giving the press conference when they eloped, pictures of them at the Chateau Marmont. So I, um, I highly recommend this book about Jean's life, her career, incredibly exquisite photographs. And also, again, LA location. So if you want to see all these great locations throughout Los Angeles where Harlow was in her lifetime, then I highly recommend this book. And again, um, I really encourage you to seek out movies shot by Harold Rawson. You, I will, after this is over, I will post a lot of links. There's Amazon, IMDb, there's streaming services. There's so many ways to appreciate these films and the artistry behind them. And I just, I just wish Harold had been able to talk to a historian, been able to really kind of tell his story. And it's, it's kind of saddening and frustrating that that's not really out there. And I think it should be. I think it deserves to be. And he, again, he was, he was one of Hollywood's great innovators and talents. And um, it's, it's also great, too, because if, for those of you who've taken the tour, for those of you who haven't, he's kind of in between Houston and DeMille. So it's like I go to John Houston's grave and then the next celebrity famous grave is Rawson and then the next one is DeMille. So I love that he's sort of right in between the two incredible directors that he he worked with. And you know I really enjoy doing these. If you guys have suggestions, I know some of you have sent me names and I'll get to people. I promise I will. But let me know if there's certain topics you want me to cover or names you want me to cover. And I enjoy doing this and I really enjoy interacting with all of you and I just really appreciate you guys for tuning in. And also I wanted to mention if you didn't catch it, um, last weekend I did my first episode of, well first guest starring episode of Hollywood Kitchen where I cook a recipe of the star, one of the stars from Hollywood's Golden Age and um, we make some food and I talk to a collector, an author, a historian while we're making the food or whatever. And last weekend I talked to and um, Christina Rice. She is Anne Dvorak's biographer and a film historian. We made Anne Dvorak's Jello recipe. It was a lot of fun, and it's on um, my YouTube channel, which I'll post a link. And I'm planning a big announcement for Monday, August 10th, for the next Hollywood Kitchen episode. So I'm trying to put some fun content out there for everybody during the quarantine time. And oh yes, you love the peacock. Thank you so much. Um, my old tour dress I had for over 10 years and it was in bad shape and I needed a new tour dress. I saw this one at Unique Vintage. I saw the peacock and I was like, I have to buy this because it fits in perfectly with the peacocks at the cemetery. So anyway, John Houston, yes, that's a great one. I will get into that one. Jane Mansfield, yes, that's another great one. And um, I get the impression Harley was one of the nicest starts. I do too. I do too. I think that she really appreciated the crew and she actually stood up for the rights of the crew and you know made sure they were treated well and yeah i think she was a genuinely very kind person and again i can't recommend those two books enough that i i talked to you about uh harlow and hollywood the bombshell and the glamour capital and bombshell the life and death of jean harlow by david Sten. so um that's pretty much it for this episode of Hollywood Kitchen, but I will post some resources here on this page when I when I log off. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is so much fun, and I definitely look forward to seeing you next week.